All right, welcome everybody. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about bonding. Um, previously, we've discussed the types of bonding. Um, we've also spoken about the octet rule um, and how elements want to bond in order to satisfy the octet rule. They want a full um, set of eight valence electrons, okay? Now, there are several exceptions to this rule. So the first being hydrogen. Hydrogen um, only has one orbital, the 1s orbital. And so it's only able to have two valence electrons. Helium also is an exception, but since helium is a noble gas and already has a full set of valence electrons, um, we don't really consider it an exception. Um, it's just not gonna bond because it's already satisfied. Um, another exception to the octet rule is gonna be beryllium. Beryllium only has two orbitals, so it's going to have a total of four valence electrons. Boron has three orbitals, so it's only going to have six valence electrons. And there are several elements um, in periods three through seven that will not only use their s orbital and their p orbitals to bond, but will also use d orbitals because they have those in the larger energy levels. Um, therefore, in periods three through seven, they can have more than eight valence electrons. Some of them can have 10 or 12 valence electrons. Um, okay, so we need to talk about VESPER, okay? And that's how you say that word, VESPER. It stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. Okay, Vesper, V, I know it's V-S-E, but it's pronounced V-E-S, okay? Valence, shell, electron, pair, repulsion. That's what Vesper is. What does it mean? What is happening here? Um, remember that electrons all have the same charge. Okay, they're all negatively charged. And so because they have the same charge, similar charges repel. So what this is gonna do is lone pairs of electrons and atoms, terminal atoms in the molecule will push away from each other. they repel each other. And so they try to get as far away from each other within the molecule as they possibly can, okay? Um, so here we have some examples. If we look at this first molecule, I have a central atom and two terminal atoms, one on either side. Those atoms have spread themselves apart to positions as far away from each other as possible, okay? Lone pairs of electrons are extra electrons that were assigned to the central atom. Um, there are no lone pairs of electrons on this first drawing. Zero lone pair. Because those atoms have moved to a position where they're as far away from each other as possible, 180 degrees away from each other, um, they form a straight line. And so we call the geometry of this molecule linear. Um, now this is where things get a little bit complicated. And it really doesn't have to be terribly complicated. I want you guys to remember back to electron configuration. Remember that within an energy level, you can have one orbital in the S sublevel. There are three orbitals in the P sublevel. And there are five orbitals in the D sublevel. So in this molecule, the central atom is using two orbitals, one for this bond and one for this bond one of those orbitals is going to be an s orbital. The other orbital is a p orbital. Instead of having different kinds of orbitals on either side of the atom, the central atom will take the s orbital and the p orbital that it's going to use for bonding and blend them together to form a hybrid. That hybrid will be called sp because those are the two orbitals that were used. So it's going to have an sp orbital on either side. This will get better, watch. So looking at this one, um, it's still just three atoms. I have a central atom, I have two terminal atoms. 
But in addition to the two terminal atoms, I also have two lone pairs of electrons. Lone pair here, lone pair there. Those lone pairs push away from each other, and they also push away from the terminal atoms. So what that does is it bends the atoms downward in the molecule, and we call this shape bent. There are two lone pairs, and we're gonna talk more about why lone pairs are important in a minute. Um, each of them is occupying an orbital from the central atom. So this central atom has one orbital for this lone pair, one orbital for that lone pair, an orbital for this bond, and an orbital for that bond. It's using four orbitals. So if we look at this, we're gonna have to use an s orbital, a p orbital, and two more p orbitals to make four. So the hybridization of this one is s p three. For the next one, the central atom is bonded to three terminal atoms. There are no lone pairs of electrons. Those three terminal atoms have taken positions as far away from each other as possible. It looks like a triangle, so we call this trigonal planar. Since it's using one, two, three orbitals for bonding, the hybridization is gonna be S, P1, P2, S, P2. Let me flip this over. Okay, so looking at this next drawing, again, three terminal atoms, but there's a lone pair of electrons, and that lone pair of electrons has repelled the other terminal atoms downwards. There's one lone pair doing that. Um, and so what it does is it kind of makes a pyramid shape. We call it trigonal pyramidal. Um, and since the central atom is using one, two, three orbitals for bonding, and another orbital for the lone pair of electrons, S P1, P2, P3, the hybridization is sp3. Looking at the next one, there's also three terminal atoms, um, but there are two lone pair of electrons on the central atom. This forces it into a T shape. In order for the atoms and pairs of electrons to get as far away from each other as possible, it kind of makes a letter T. And so if I look at the central atom, it's using one orbital for this bond, another for this one, another for this one, another for this lone pair here, but yet another for this lone pair here. So it's actually using five different orbitals. So if I go back to this, um, I'm gonna have to use an S orbital, one, two, three P orbitals, but I also need a D orbital in order to have the five orbitals necessary for bonding. So the hybridization of this one is going to be S, P3, D. Okay, looking at the next one, there are no lone pairs of electrons, there's no dots on that central atom. Um, I just have four terminal atoms, and so it makes itself into a tetrahedral shape. And since I have one, two, three, four bonds, I need one, two, three, four orbitals, an S and three Ps will work, so the hybridization is S, P3. Okay, for the next one, it's also four terminal atoms, but also one lone pair of electrons. There's an extra set of electrons on the central atom. So this central atom has to use one, two, three, four orbitals for bonding and one more for the lone pair of electrons. So it's gonna need five total areas, S, P3, D. For the next one, there are no lone pairs, but there are six different terminal atoms, which means six orbitals are necessary for bonding. So if I look back at this, I'm gonna need an S, three Ps, and two Ds in order to have six orbitals for bonding. So the hybridization of this one is gonna be S, P3, D2. Okay, next one. Um, you have one, two, three, four, five terminal atoms and one lone pair of electrons. So that's gonna be six areas um, in which we need electrons to bond. So that's gonna be six orbitals. Again, S, P3, D2. This is only four terminal atoms, but also two lone pair of electrons. 
it, I have one lone pair on top and one lone pair on the bottom, so the four terminal atoms almost take like corners of a box, a square, okay? So there are two lone pair. There's one, two, three, four orbitals for bonding and two more for the lone pair. So again, sp3, d2. And for the last one, there are no lone pairs. There's just five terminal atoms. I need five orbitals in which to do this. So S, P3, D. Okay, so I said I was gonna talk about why lone pairs are important. When we're talking about polarity, that's how we determine whether or not something is polar, okay? So listen, this is very easy. Polarity is almost like a magnet, okay? That means there's a positive end and a negative end, okay? If something is polar, it's gonna to wanna to stick to other magnets. So polar molecules are often attracted to each other. How can you tell if a molecule is polar? Well, that's actually really easy. If there are any lone pairs on the central atom, then it's a polar molecule. Those lone pairs are like the negative end. Remember, electrons are negative. So that's like the negative end of the magnet. If there are no lone pairs, then it's nonpolar. Molecules are not gonna be attracted to each other, okay? Um, another way in which something can be polar is if I have different kinds of terminal atoms. Okay, so for example, if I have a central atom and I have three atoms of element A and one atom of element B, I'm not gonna have the same number of electrons on all sides. B might have more or fewer than A. And so because I don't have a symmetrical molecule with the same number of electrons spread throughout, it's gonna be polar. Um, so polarity causes intermolecular forces. Okay, so intermolecular forces are the forces of attraction between molecules. This is abbreviated IMF. So when they're asking you for IMF, they're asking you to name one of these, okay? The first one, the strongest one, is dipole-dipole interaction. And that is when you have polar molecules. Um, now, hydrogen bonding is a special kind of dipole-dipole attraction that happens when you have a polar molecule with hydrogen. Remember that hydrogen has no other electrons besides the two that are in the bond, so it's very positive. Meanwhile, if on the other side of the molecule you have just extra electrons that are negative, it's gonna make a very strong magnet. So this is a very, very strong force of attraction. Okay, hydrogen bonding. That means you have a polar molecule and you have hydrogen, okay? Um, the weakest force of attraction is between nonpolar molecules. That's called London dispersion forces. And we abbreviate that LDF, okay? So that's whenever you have nonpolar molecules they're not magnets, they're not attracted to each other very strongly, there's a very weak force of attraction between them, okay? Um, now, this isn't gonna be the answer in the homework that I give you, but if you ever have a mixture of a polar substance and a nonpolar substance, then what you're gonna get is dipole-induced dipole interaction. So that means that the magnet of one kind of causes a magnet in another, even though it doesn't really have one on its own. So it's weaker than dipole-dipole interaction, the one where they're all magnetic, but it's stronger than the one where none of them are magnets, blended dispersion forces, okay? Now, I didn't give you any mixtures in your assignment, so this isn't gonna be the answer for any of them. Your answer is either gonna be dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, or blended dispersion forces. So let's take a look at that assignment really quickly. 
you can do one of them with you. Um, so if I look at number two in this assignment, um, silicon tetrabromide, okay, is the name of the molecule. It starts off, the first thing you do is you start counting up valence electrons. These are all gonna be covalent, okay? Um, silicon is in the same group as carbon, so it has four valence electrons. And then there are four bromine atoms, each one has seven valence electrons. So the total for this is 32, divide by two, and this molecule has 16 pairs of electrons. Um, silicon is the least electronegative element, so it goes in the center. Position the bromines around. And for the initial Lewis dot structure, it doesn't matter how they're positioned, okay? This is like a rough sketch. So then we connect, 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 connect. I just used up four pairs of electrons doing that because each line represents a pair. So I subtract four. And I've got 12 pairs of electrons left to put on this molecule. I start by filling up the octet of each of the terminal atoms. So I use three pair here, six, nine, 12, and I'm done. I don't have any extra electrons, so I'm not gonna put any lone pairs. And if there are no lone pairs on this molecule, then the polarity is nonpolar. It's only when you have extra pairs and you put them on the central atom that you have a polar molecule, okay? Now, to figure out the shape, I just look back at my notes and I look for the molecule that has four terminal atoms and no lone pairs. And if I look at that on my sheet, it looks a lot like a tetrahedral molecule, okay? Four lone pairs, or I'm sorry, four terminal atoms, no lone pairs at all. So the shape is tetrahedral. Um, if I look at the hybridization, then for the tetrahedral, it says that it's sp3, okay? That just comes straight from the notes. And I can think about it, I'm using an s orbital and one, two, three p orbitals in order to make those four bonds. If this is a nonpolar molecule, then the only IMF is London dispersion forces. So I'm just gonna put LDF. If, if, if it happens to be polar, then you would put dipole, dipole there. If it's polar and there's hydrogen in the molecule, then you put hydrogen bonding. Those are the three options for intermolecular forces. For the final 3D structure, what you're gonna do is you're gonna redraw this molecule. Like I said, for the rough sketch, it doesn't matter where it's positioned. But for the final 3D structure, you need to put it in its actual shape. So in a tetrahedral, you have one on top, and then the three of these are making like a pyramid down at the bottom. Those are the positions where they're the furthest away from each other. So I'm gonna put silicon in the middle, bromine up top, and then make sure that I have my pyramid down at the bottom. Make sure you put all the electrons on there that are supposed to be on there. But notice now that we understand Vesper, valence shell electron pair repulsion, we understand that these atoms have moved to positions as far away from each other as possible. So this is how you complete this worksheet, and I hope this helps with your notes. Thanks.